Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for our fourth weekly show presented to you by Join Cycling. This is the last, well, not the last one we're doing, but this is the last solitary weekly show. A lot of you have been saying, where are the, the daily recaps? They're coming back. Don't worry. We've got World Tour Racing like Omlope, like UAE Tour coming up this week. We'll be previewing those races in this episode as well as recapping Algarve. The Andalusia that wasn't, as well as, uh, yeah, some other talking points like Alberson de Koenig's double denim kit, um, <laughs> Benelux special. But what have you been up to, Ben? I just pulled you out of a, what, a race or something. Um, yeah, just wrote, a, just wrote a Zwift race, but wasn't the best Zwift race in the first place. So I thank you for pulling me out of a Zwift race this time. I, I needed an excuse to, to dip out. I'll be honest about it. I was suffering. But... I've enjoyed the week of racing and uh, I don't know, I expected more races because some of them actually got cancelled, which is unfortunate. But on the other end, the racing that we did got, I enjoyed quite a few races throughout that. But I am I am craving the classics at this point. I'm craving for Omlop, yeah, I'm too. craving for, for Kurne as well, which in previous years I wasn't craving Kurne as much. But this time around, I'm like, bam, I want it. I want it right now on my plate. I want to eat it. But hey, it's a few days to go, but UAE Tour will... Uh, will be a good taster, I reckon, beforehand. There might be crosswinds tomorrow, I think, in the UAE Tour, but yeah, I'm keen for some cobble action too. Uh, the warm-up races certainly have felt like that. Uh, but as I said, this episode is brought to you by Join Cycling. Join Cycling is an adaptive training platform that I've been using to get in shape for our classics campaign, Benji and I, in the middle of March in Flanders. I did the, I'm in the middle of the classics program. You put in your target event, the target date, and sort of the specifications of the event, and then your availability, all the parameters that you can control, and then join creates an adaptive training plan for you. So I had a really, really good week of training, my biggest week in probably five years, I would say. I did back to back three and a half hour rides. And then even did a, fan, a really, really good tempo ride yesterday, got to 90 minutes and then binned it <laughs> on down. It was really, it's like that, it's in that in-between zone. It's really sunny, but I was coming down Port Caboose, bam, hit some shade, too much brake. And the, my brakes on the e-bike are set up the wrong way, the Euro way, which is incorrect. I just grabbed way too much and uh, <laughs> slid out. But that's fine. End of the ride, Mrs. Rouge had to go pick me up, look down. My joint workout score was still 9 out of 10, so I was like, well, maybe it was meant to be. <laughs> Crashing Question. There. Do you also have the issue that you switch between bikes with brakes on the opposite yes. ends? Yes. Me too. It's I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it because, like, I just grabbed way too much. Uh, like, I thought I was going to be feathering back brake a little bit and yeah. just mash front brake the wrong side. Uh, so that was it. And, yeah, I've gone too fast, obviously, and I'm... I ain't Tom Pickcock, uh, so but, uh, <laughs> You're okay. we, we move. We, yeah, yeah, we move on. Just a little, luckily with winter gear, I'm wearing. You know, it's just my hands and stuff. Um, in case people see those, I thought I'd explain at the outset. But if you want to check out Joint Cycling, many of you have, and it's great to see that. And you're already getting on board with the training programs for your training. You can get a special offer for listeners to the LRCP, a 30 day free trial period without even inputting your credit card as well as then at the end of that free trial period you get a six-month subscription offer at a discount via email for some of you early activators that'll be coming up shortly that offer so make sure you, ch you stay tuned for that email you just need to download the joint cycling app in the app store or play store and go to join.cc slash lantern rouge to begin or to get that offer uh rather so there's no no strings attached. Go check it out if you like it, which I'm sure many of you will. Uh, then you you can got that free, uh, free 30 day offer, and you don't have to bin it like me. So I'll be on the trainer <laughs> this week. I'll say I I broke my rear shifter, my well, right shifter. I just snapped off. I was that's the the worst bit. All right, enough about me. We can talk about uh, mechanicals now though. Someone who did see he had a shifting issue, same one he couldn't shift in Algarve. Mr. Remco Evenepoel this week, uh, he wins GC at Tour of Algarve. He does. He wins the TT. Does the business there. Yeah. Defends. Didn't need to win the two GC days. No other issues. That's fine. 
Uh, but then today he got beaten by Martinez again in the sprint. He said he couldn't shift. He did the whole re- final of the stage in the big ring. Was that what he said? Yeah, that's what he said after the stage. When he crossed the line, I felt like he was like looking down to his stem and was like feeling whether his front tire was like flat or something. Yeah. So I was I was expecting the the sprinter's excuse of oh I've got a flat tire in the sprint or something, but then he comes with the uh, explanation of the of being stuck in the big ring. I I'll be honest, I haven't checked whether he was stuck in the big ring on the footage or anything, so I, I can't say if he was or not. What's sorry? I think he was. But Fa- Fabio's taught him well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be honest, when you look at the, the stage to Foyer and Martinez sprint, Martinez sprint was look. He looked like he was back in that Liège, best on Liège, twenty twenty two yeah. form. He that sprint, it was really really impressive on Foyer, and also today. I'm not sure the gearing would have made too much of a difference. So he wins yeah. two stages, second on GC. Uh, Van Aert won. He didn't go for the first sprint. Went for the third sprint. Uh, positioned himself quite well. His TT was a bit lackluster, or not a bit, a bit, it was quite lackluster, I would say, his <laughs> TT. Him and Ghana yeah. uh, were really not good TTs, Mate. but he said he hasn't been training it, I guess. Del Toro did better than both of them, so that was really impressive yeah. for a rider that I didn't know had a TT, so now we know that he has a TT for the future, so that's going to be curious for the other races as well. His climbing was not at top level compared to the Remco's of the world, but he's still young, so it's curious what right type of rider he'll turn into but about the martinez remco sprint one thing i do want to mention is that i feel like i feel like remco lost the second sprint in the same way he lost the first sprint as in if you lose a long sprint against martinez on alto de foya then i feel like you got to try something differently on alto de mayau and there we see the same exact scenario happen where martinez once again comes over him in the last bit of that sprint so i would have either tried to attack earlier or force a a closer to the line sprint because do you think Martinez beats Remco in the last 200 meter sprint versus yeah. the 600 meter one as well? Yeah, I think so. He just I don't know better. about that. I think Remco should have. Martinez was too active closing people in the mid in the mid phase of the climb. Martinez closed uh, Scaroni. That was yeah. the moment for Remco to counter him and do his. I think Remco was the strongest maybe on the climb overall. Uh, and that was the moment. But he didn't need to expose himself like that because, you know, what if he then gets counted and loses GC? So I guess he didn't have yeah, as much to lose. I do have this thing where whenever Remco loses, he does end up saying something in an interview most of the time where he's like, oh, I lost because of this. And even if it's true, even if it's true that he's in the big ring or that he makes a mistake in the last kilometer that otherwise he would have won, I would enjoy seeing that humility of like saying fair play, Martinez won it, stuff like that. You know, I, I kind, I, I would like that more. That makes sense. Yeah, I think you said something like that on stage two as well. It's like Martinez cooked you and put six seconds into third. Like sometimes another ride is just better. It's like if yeah. Pid- Pidcock closed Coos and, and Malau and he shouldn't have. You know, could he say, "Oh, I lost the stage because I may, yeah, maybe, but not really." Like, I don't know. Sometimes the criticism of Remco is unwarranted. A lot of the time, sometimes I think he opens the door for people to have a crack at him as well. Yeah. So, a uh, bit of both. But yeah, he wins GC hand- handily, his third uh, win in this race. Andalusia, unfortunately, uh, didn't happen. There was farmers' protests, which kind of like when the Tour of Britain got cancelled in two thousand twenty. Two, yeah. when the Queen died, it meant that police resources were diverted. And so I, I think it meant they couldn't, they didn't have the necessary police resources to run the race because the Guardia Seville got called to Madrid, Yeah, as I, as I understand it. Uh, and basically, we didn't know what the race would be. We knew we'd have a TT. Then it was supposed to be a TT plus 200k stages on the weekend circuits. And then eventually those didn't even happen. So we had one prologue. <laughs> TT, a 5K 3.5% TT uh, on the Friday, which, you know, is a real shame for the race. Like, yeah. Because, yeah, the organizers, uh, yeah, like this is this is their race and they, it's a lot of logistics and planning went into it and it just doesn't happen for outside external reasons. Uh, but, yeah, Maxim Van Hills wins. Bit of a surprise to me. I thought Wellens would win or Ayuso and a lot yep. of Destiny did really, really well overall. But, the UCI should, uh, they got to knock this down to a dot one or give it the Chrono de Nation 
ranking Benji? The Chrono de Nation ranking. Like, to be clear, originally this is a, a two dot pro race, which means it's a stage race of the dot pro level, which means it has 200 GC UCI points and 20 for the stage win. So that would deliver 220 towards Maxim von Gils. But let's be honest about it. For a 4.9 kilometer TT, I find that a bit overdone. It's a bit ridiculous. So I would expect lower. Option one is reducing it to a 1.pro, which is a one-day race of the same level, which would be 200 UCI points. But in my mind, that's kind of still a bit much. So, but then again, can you... I think it should stay the, the dot .pro it is, but the UCI points delivery should be different. So it should be like an exception to the UCI rules that is not written in the UCI rules. I see nothing that they can apply on paper, but I, would, I wouldn't give it more than a 1.125 1, points. <laughs> True, because if you make it a one-day dot pro race, it's still two hundred points. Uh, yeah. So bit of a bit of a strange one. Uh, also, the riders that were there, you know, their week of training or whatever, they've been completely yeah. messed about. So if you if the, the teams that didn't send riders to that race probably were thankful they didn't. Uh, in the end, uh, Tour of Oman also finished midweek. Magnier and Lamperti were good again, and then Capio won a reduced sprint, and then Adam Yates cooked everybody on uh, Green Mountain. Jabal al Akhtar breaking the record with ease. I think he could have gone much, much faster, yeah. and uh, that's a very ominous sign for the UAE Tour uh, coming up this week. Alps Maritime and Classic VAR, they didn't, what they've done is instead of it being a three-day stage race, they made it a one-day race and a two-day stage race, so there's more points. I think that increases the points by like 30%. Mate. Is everybody robbing the the format of the Tour Down Under, as in a classic before they have the actual race? Then we have the Muscat classic before the uh, Salman. Then the Schwabe now classic we have this. doesn't give UCI points. Oh, yeah, true. It's a non UCI race. This yeah. time it is, right? Classic VAR. The problem for TDU is Cadell's is after TDU. If Cadell's <laughs> and the teams leave, yes. Cadell's needs to be start of January. But when they're doing the Geelong Bay crits before TDU and Surf Coast Classic, so you get the team staying for Wait, TDU. The Geelong Bay crits are those, those like sprint criterions where you have yeah. two riders sprinting against each other or something. Yeah, but they're in the, that's in the same area near Melbourne. Oh, okay. Um, they're on the New Year's Day, but that's that's the same as the race talkies around there. So that's the problem with Cadell's is it's it, you have to wait another week and a half so teams like uh, I don't think Yumbo Me, uh, Vismo men's team did it uh, anyway classic far Johannesson <laughs> out sprinted everybody and then he thought the finish line was earlier it wasn't puts the hands up and then Lenny Martinez scoots past him uh, to win the race I don't know I've looked at the finish a few times Benji they were saying oh there's an Arrive sign I don't think there was no. an Arrive sign at 25 meters. I think that was at the finish. There was no Arrive sign at 25 meters to go that I could see, but there was like a metal construction that looked like a bit of a, an arch around the road at 25 meters to go. To me, that didn't really seem like a, a finish line, but if you're in the middle of a very hard effort, you just die to, to try and win this race. I can see how you could confuse that, but it's, it's, so, oh, it's so painful to watch. It's painful and funny to watch. And... Oh, like to see Lenny Martinez win is always fun, but to see Johannesson lose in this fashion because he was pretty dominant on on this final hill. So he uh, was a great performance to, against Bardet, who went too early. So Johannesson cooked, but Lenny served the plate. He ate it. He ate whatever meal <laughs> he served. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it is. If you, I can't remember. If it actually, had a roof. Whatever arch it was, I guess by definition, an arch must have a roof. Otherwise, it's not an arch. Uh, I didn't know that. If it, it's very strange to go underneath a structure at twenty-five meters to go. <laughs> like that, that is strange. Mate, so, to the under did it with Ella Philippe did, celebrating the KOM points. Was a hundred meters to go. That was just a line but, on the ground. On the ground, I think. <laughs> it's even worse. It's a finish line on the ground for the KOM. I, I swear, there's some <laughs> races where there's like a million lines on the ground. It's. I'm not surprised this doesn't happen more often. Uh, in the actual two-day stage race. Uh, a little bit not as good as the yesteryear of Quintana against Wellens, but nonetheless, uh, Ethan Vernon won a reduced sprint uh, for Israel Premier Tech, his new team. They were here with Woods and Fulsang, and then uh, I think Sean Flynn became like an option for DSM on on GC. But yeah, 
he got dropped today and then there was like a million riders on the French teams attacking each other on the final sort of gradual climb and then Cosnefro won a reduced punch uh, sprint and even thinner sprint and importantly his team at Paris Pantra who led him out took the bonies away from Albanese Mini yeah. Cosnefro also won GC Albanese I was surprised to see not picked up by another team a uh, good signing for Arkea so Benoit back Benji Decathlon, I think this is their this is the best they've looked in a long time, I must say. Oh uh, well Gull wasn't too bad last year in the tour, so that that's a thing, but I, mm. I agree that in these smaller French races that they're more prominent that they were than they were last year, in my opinion. And to one to a stage like this shows that we're probably going to see them winning more of these French-type races throughout the season. And hopefully, they can also pick up a, a race of a higher level throughout this year. Because we want to see uh, Benoit back in action on the on the punchy hills whenever they uh, exist in Paris-Nice or Tour de France or Dauphiné or something. We want Benoit back. But anyway, those races are past us. We've also got a women's race, a one-week stage race, four days uh, technically. Balsamo won the sprint. Uh, won the sprint on the first day, ahead of Mariana Vos. Bit of a... I would say a reduced sprint, there were, but there were quite a bit of riders in the group. As in, it was reduced initially, but then people came back. Stage 2 was more of a, a GC kind of day where there was a, a group that survived the climbs. And then Royster had a very well-timed attack for, away from the group. And she took 30 seconds on the rest. And that would be a very valuable 10, uh, 30 seconds because on day 3 is the actual like queen stage with Chore de Cati. I think we know that climb from the Vuelta a few times uh, in the past. Yeah. But Nee Fisher Black, as the works teammate of Royster, was really strong that day, winning relatively comfortably, in my opinion, over Realini. So, I don't know. Is it Realini that isn't at the level I was expecting, or have we seen Fisher Black, Neve Bradbury step up, or is it a combination of both? I think Fisher Black starts seem to have stepped up. Uh, I think she's doing good numbers, and yeah, I think Fisher Black looks really, really good. Uh, maybe she's just targeted better races. It is a super steep climb, Jared de Cati, especially solo. Um, yeah. And yeah, the the SD Works machine keeps on rolling with the yeah. GC win for Royce. Like they just don't stop winning, and even holding on Royce on a climb that that difficult. I mean, it's not that difficult, but you know, it is it is the climb where Coos actually that's where he took the G C lead, I'm pretty sure. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Uh that was the day before in the Vuelta last year. I think this is the stage Roglic one where Remco led him out and didn't know where the finish yep. line was. Um <laughs> so, That's true. But hey uh, it's a hard Balsamo, climb. one stage four as well. So two stage wins for Balsamo. I'm hoping that this is a sign that we're gonna see her back at the old level, but then again last year she also won. Uh Two stages in Valenciana, which was before the classics, where she wasn't at the level I was necessarily hoping she would be. So let's hope this year is a bit better. But anyway, Classic Cajayan, the last one on the list when it comes to race recaps. Oh, just one one point on that. We okay. got to start a tracker for Cash and Naviadoma. In this race, fourth, fifth, third, second on GC. She hasn't won for a race in four and a half years. We got to get her a win. We have to will it. As an organization, as Road an institution. Race, right? We're not counting gravel worlds. <laughs> no. I don't know what that is. <laughs> CX track, gravel worlds. This this doesn't enter my estimation. It's like is it on is it on PCS listed as a professional win? If it's not, maybe the gravel ones are actually. <laughs> actually no, it's not. So not to be dismissive of that, but you know, i this is this is road cycling. Uh, it's a serious business. So yeah, we got to get her a win somehow, and she's she's so good. Yeah. Uh, maybe Omloop is not the one next week for that to happen. But yeah, sorry, go on, Benji. Classica Hayen. Classica Hayen was a bit of a race where I don't know it got reduced because of uh, because of weather conditions, if I recall correctly, where yeah, there were limited. Rained. Yeah, the rain, for example, but there were limited gravel segments left. It was already changed to parkour to an easier climbs because in the past there were like long gravel climbs now it was like shorter gravel climbs <laughs> that's how i would uh explain this parkour but oil lascano was basically in a breakaway with four minute advantage when the gravel segment started and i started watching this race when the gravel segment started and i saw lascano in a four minute breakaway and i was like who let him in there like 
I was shocked he was in there in the first place because I consider Lascano a rider for for winning this from the group behind already. I couldn't believe it when I looked. I saw five minute lead. What has happened there? And I'm, I'm not sure it's like there's no television coverage. We don't know exactly what happened, but I couldn't. I was like, what the hell? Five minutes. You're never, you're, you're never going to bring it back because the finish is not that hard anymore. And it's not like a 220K yep. race. So, yeah, he basically, Van Aert punctured, Ineos sent it. Yum, uh, the Visma Lisa Bike Riders were there with Wellens. They attacked. It stopped. Las Cano trucked along with Nicola Prudhomme and uh, never they never caught him. So <laughs> that was the race, really. I would say yeah. that's why Decathlon, the reason I say they're having their better yeah. season so far, is sort of this race where you see someone like Nicola Prudhomme who's been, he's been cannon fodder in stage racing breakaways in the past. Yes. And then I thought the same would happen here. And then he's attacking Las Cano. He's finishing fifth. He's not collapsing. And Tronchon, who also was showed a bit of promise, but not too much, he beats Tratnik and Wellens. Admittedly, he was sitting on, but he beats Tratnik and Wellens to finish second in this race. And so they got Prudom, Prodom and Tronchon second and fifth. And that's just amongst those Carno, kind of Tratnik, Wellens, and Kwiatkowski, etc. That's where I'm like, ooh. So maybe they're Sierra Camp. They're all in Granada, I think. Maybe that worked. Maybe the bikes are better. I don't know. Uh, but certainly 19th last year in the ranking, the sponsors want to want them to do better than that. I also hope that we can see that same effect on Felix Gull because imagine Felix Gull with like a, a bit of a step up again if yeah. he can find a way to TT like a, like a, a regular cyclist, then he might be able to get close. He was 14th at the Andalusia TT, but that was a bit of a climbing one, 3.5%. So I'm not sure I can consider that 100% as the one we need to look at, but... I want to see that Barry Nies, I think, is his right next race. I want to see what he does there, to be honest. It's it's not in my head the ideal parkour for Felix Gall. No, Torreno would have been better. But hey, we will still see whether he has form or not, regardless of that. Tronchon was also a name next to Prodom, so fully agree. I just wonder if Orlascana will also be underestimated when it comes to the classics that are coming. Because nah. if you see what he does in Hayen, <laughs> he's on the level of... Is he on the level of Mohoric, if you see the, no. the type of rider? Or like, no. where would you place him? Asgren? Asgren? Well, let's be serious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends what Asgren you get. It's kind of like, Lascano right now might be better than Asgren, but Asgren's got a very wide range of what he can do. <laughs> uh, world beater or dropped in from a group of 80. I don't know which one you're going to get this classic season. Uh, but in terms of Las Cano being allowed in the breakaway, again, oh, absolutely no. not. <laughs> uh, we, you know, opening weekend, and uh, it's not happening. Uh, the, word is, the word has come down from everybody, of course, because he's just so annoying. If you were like in... No, because this is what happens, right? That's why he's so effective. It's like he actually is more like, to me, Dylan Van Baaler is a better comparison uh, because he just does his pace the whole time, this heavy, heavy pace. He climbs really well, especially on the gradual stuff. And then, you know, UAE, Yumbo, Ineos are starting to infight behind. The second they stop, they give back another 30 seconds because he just keeps trucking. Yep. And technically, Prolom was beating him a bit on the downhills and the corners, but just the raw power of this guy is... Yeah, so I think Dylan Van Baal is a good uh, comp for him. That's how I could see him winning Roubaix in a similar fashion, actually. But yeah, he's, unfortunately for him, he's put the marker down that last year wasn't a fluke, so... And I'd, like, be su- I'd be surprised if he was allowed to break. He's going to be arriving at Classics races solo... In his team, like he's not going to have much support surrounding him in the classics, yeah. I would reckon. So Lascano is going to be a lone man, but I feel like that also kind of frees him in some shape or form. So I'm curious what that does. But anyway, let's get to the previews of the of the next few races coming up. We got cool races coming up: UAE Tour, Omlop, Kurne. How about we start with the UAE Tour and then we jump into like a proper classics preview? Yeah, because we'll do a classics deep dive. I want to talk about it, but anyway, <laughs> UAE Tour, two sprints. Plus Jabal Jais, then three sprints, then Jabal Hafid. The usual scenario, Jabal Hafid as last stage was a great change in my opinion. But in reality, 
I think Adam Yates cleans this unless they find a way to get rid of him in echelons. Well, stage one, oh, I'm a bit of a specialist on the parkour in the Middle East. Stage one looks different to me. They're going okay. from Madinat Zayed to Liva. I don't know if they've done this before, but they go south into what looks to me like a, a, a hilly dune zone around a, a cycle track and no categorized climbs, but it looks very, very up and down, short stage. Don't know the wind conditions, but that looks different. Don't, we, we don't know how difficult those hills are. Uh, but maybe it is It is just a sprint. Uh, Al Hudirat Island uh, TT we've seen before. That's a big loop. Oh, yeah, not a big loop, 12Ks. Dan has done well there before. I think won that one. Dubai Harbour we know as a sprint. And uh, the uh, yeah, the others are uh, basically sprints. You know, Jais and uh, Hafeet. So usually stage one was the crosswind stage but it, it's a different stage this year it is in the desert so maybe if the wind is right we could get it tomorrow i guess to your point benji if you're not uae you guys got you got to try drop him tomorrow you have to yep i think so as well like there's also the fact that when it comes to other gc riders i'm looking at a bill bow von wilder jan here who was good at green mountain but then again who knows, he might get poisoned again at UAE Tour. Aina Rubio, Simon Carr. Simon Carr is also a name where I feel like at Mallorca he was good, so I feel like top 10 here is not impossible. Van Eetveld top 10, I reckon, is also possible. Pool, Bart Lemon. <laughs> yeah. He's there. I'm I'm seeing Valter also on the on the provisional start list. I'm not sure if he's confirmed or not. Yeah, but... Valter's doing it. So yeah, I feel like I feel like Yates is like a lot above all the rest. Yeah, because there's no Remco last the year and then Poggy other years. Yeah. So th- there is a big gap. And then Plap was good in the, really good in the TT. So there's not even like a a really strong TTing GC rider who'll beat him in yeah. the TT and defend on her feet. Because Yates has got a better TT than, yeah, most of the other serious guys here, I would say. He's, he's no slouch. So... Like Bill Bow, he put 54 seconds into on her feet last year, and there's no way Bill Bow beats him by 30 in the TT. Yeah, correction. I said sprint on stage two, but it's obviously a TT. It's 12.1 kilometers. Yeah, completely flat. It's the the typical one on the on like little island thingy. Right? Yeah, yeah. There's some good photos normally of that one with the cityscape behind. Um, the yeah, there's a TTT last year, which I believe Quickstep won with a uh, Merlier and. Remco, the yeah Yates is the is the prohibitive favorite. Frankly, yeah. I don't see him losing. Like unless there's heavy yeah. crosswinds tomorrow or he crashes, they're just I, there's no way he can lose uh, because he just the others can't do his his thirty minute twenty five minute numbers that he, he can do. Uh, and he, he just showed on on Green Mountain he broke the record breathing through his nose. He could have gone much much quicker. And I like I like Van Aedfeld, but um nah, nah. to like, date he, he hasn't shown it. the watts. Yeah. Like Yates of played in the Tour de France last year. We all know how good he is. Uh, the sprinting, Benji, seems a lot more equal to me. This is what I'm looking forward to perhaps more, is this is, like, really, really stacked. I'll wrap... Jakobsen, Coy, Decline. Jesus, Luke wrote this. Got three Dutch riders first. Uh, Groves, Cavendish, Milano, Bauhaus, Grunewecker, Merlier, Wellsford, Bennett, Moreshko. I don't know how he got in here. What the hell are Polar Bear doing here? Viviani, Ackerman, <laughs> Gaviria. That is a... Who are we missing? Philipson. Yeah. He ain't here. Don't you think it's a bit strange they sent Philipson to openings weekend and Groves to UAE? I would have done it the other way around. I think it's probably a personal decision that Philipson wants to ride the opening okay. weekend because I would have indeed said that Philipson can clean these sprints. I think that's fair to say. Instead, we're now going to see Groves most likely lose these sprints because... Groves was good at La Vuelta, but he was sprinting against lesser competition. And he's not a pure flat sprinter 100%. He's a, a versatile sprinter in my eyes still. And yes, he can sprint relatively well against second tier and third tier sprinters, but against the top sprinters, he's unlikely to, to beat them every time. So I'm looking at, I hope that Jakobsen gets it right, because that means we've got another man at the top level again this year. But I think it's going to be... Melir, Wellsford, and Koy sharing the sprints this year in UAE Tour. 
Yeah, Merlier, I think, looks the sharpest. He just, he's had a really bad lead out the last two years. Like, really, really bad uh, a lot of the time. When he is in position, he is, he wins. Uh, Tudor have a good lead out. Visma don't bring Affini or Van Aert. So, it's the Van Dyke brothers and Van der Sande yeah. uh, uh, with Coy. So, they won't have the strongest lead out. Uh, I would say in terms of, yeah, strongest lead outs and sprinter, it, it, you can't go past Bora Hansgrohe. Wellsford yep. with Mullen, Van Poppel, Gamper, Masiuk. It's They've showed in TDU. We've got the same easy stages here. Van Poppel put Bennett in position to win multiple times a couple of years ago or last year, and he couldn't finish it off. And, and so Wellsford and that train is, is the is the team to beat. I would yep. say Cav comes here with Merku Siritsa No Bowl, uh, who was with him in Colombia. Uh, but we'll see how they go against stiffer competition than he had in uh, South America. Yeah. Bowl's go doing the opening weekend. He's going to Omaha. Okay. So okay. that's why why he's not here. But it, it's still a lot of sprinting competition. It's still good to see. But I wish Philipson was here because then we could see the top sprinters sprint against each other in a race that is, in my opinion, one of the best races to see sprinters race against each other throughout the season because these are the most straight, straightforward sprints you often get. And that's why I also enjoy these sprint stage in the OE Tour more than a lot of people, apparently. Then again, I also I, tune I enjoy in them. with 5K to go. So because no, you, you compare the sprinter style this year to the Giro of the Vuelta, tour aside. Yeah. It's an unbelievable start list for sprinters. Every team yep. is brought... Like Ackerman, I've not seen him on Israel Premier Tech yet. Bennett, I've seen him so far not looking good in, in Provence. Well, too good, but uh, he, how will he go? So, uh, at decathlon. So, I'm really looking forward to it. Maybe Milano, with not much of a lead out, will steal a stage like he did uh, last year. But yeah, UA with McNulty, Vine Yates. Honestly, could... Uh, not just winning, but two on the podium is probably the, the bare minimum they'll be expecting. Yeah. Uh, I would say. Anything Anything else to look out for from this race, Benji? Probably the biggest World Tour stage race uh, so far this year. Not really. I think that's the list I have. I think <laughs> Yates is going to destroy GC. I, uh, I'm curious to see what Ivan Eidfeld can do after the Mallorca challenges, what Bart Lemon can do after Santa Surrender to kind of see a a view on that again and to see what Jan Hirt can do as well because if Jan Hirt can keep that level throughout the entire year that he had at uh, Jabal Agdar then he can also be a a strong nomastic for Quick Seven. you're right Foss TT yeah there's quite a bit of interesting things to look at so yeah yeah that's UA2 and it's during the day so I like it okay now on to the classics the season starting opening weekend with Omlope and Kerner, I'm pretty sure. No, I am sure. The Omlop route is the same, starting in Ghent, uh, going finishing in Nineveh. It is a pretty hard race. I went and watched the 2017 edition today because someone shared on Twitter Sagan uh, riding with Van Avermaet and Van, Mark- Van Marker. It's actually, I love watching the old races, Benji, because then I compare. Yeah. The way Sagan rode is so different to MVDP. Sagan was in a group of six at 50Ks to go and literally pulled to the finish, basically. He nev- and he, he lost. Yeah, of course. He, and he <laughs> lost. I was like, no surprise he lost. Uh, it's like unbelievable. Uh, Mate, like, and, you know what the yeah. worst part is? We were watching the same video this morning when we woke up, me and my wife, and and the main thing that stood out to me was... This was just after he won the the Olympics, and he wasn't wearing a golden helmet. Oh, golden Greg. Yeah. He had his gold True. on his shirt, but not on his helmet. Did he get worse when they gave him the golden helmet and golden bike? Maybe it sapped well, his powers. Yeah. Who's the current Olympic champion? Carapaz. Carapaz. Yeah, and they gave him a heavy bike at Ineos because they either painted it gold or bronze. <laughs> uh... We're not making that discussion again. Is bronze or gold heavy? It was bronze. <laughs> it wasn't gold. No way. Uh, is a gram of gold heavier than a gram of bronze? I'll let you answer. But yeah, Omlo, very, very hard parkour uh, compared to that when you have the Wolvenberg, Valkenberg, and uh, the Molenberg, Berendries. Gone are the days, I think, we saw last year. But 
like the Moor Capital Moor waiting for a big blow out there, Benji. It's like the yeah. other teams are not going to wait for there when you have, I think you can't really go past uh, the Visma Lisa bike team they're bringing here is, is ridiculous. Van Aert, who won in 22, Van Baal, who won last year, Laporte, Benoit, Tratnik, Jorgensen, Affini. Uh, six of those seven riders could win this race. Fully agree to the point that you're thinking Affini is the ruler in this team. And you've got six riders that could be doing opening stuff already in like the, the earlier segments. And you've got you've got the obvious Wout van Aert and Laporte and Van Baal as well. So you've got so many riders where you're thinking, is there any team other than Visma on this start list that is going to think, oh, let me help with controlling the breakaway. Like, <laughs> yeah. fuck no. That's what we discussed a lot. Who's going <laughs> to have like... to work the entire <laughs> yeah. fucking race? <laughs> You're like, Ada, you know what? <laughs> Take a load off. <laughs> Take a load off, buddy. <laughs> we got Case Bowl back there. <laughs> Fedorov comes to the front. Get on my wheel, Ada. <laughs> I'll manage this. <laughs> You're right. It's like, it's a ridiculous team. I mean, I'm looking through maybe i mean trek are you surprised trek the, the big new, apart from that start list the the other classics rider who is not here who is in the best shape mm-hmm. not talking about mvdp or poggy that they, they never sort of do opening weekend but pedersen don't you think it's strange that he did the farmers protest classics at de Bessege <laughs> and provence and then skips opening weekend with such good shape i fully fully agree that i want to see pedersen at this race but with Milan coming to the team, I think internally they wanted to make sure Milan could ride a bunch of these classics so that Peterson can ride the ones that he actually wants to needs to win. Like or, or the ones that he wants to win. Needs to win is a bit is a I bit mean, over the top. But I agree, I would have liked to at least see him at Omlop and then Milan, for example, at Kuhne. Yes. While if I take a look at the provisional start list of Kuhne, Milan nor Peterson is on it. Where no. then I'm like Ooh. Milan has to do Kuhne. I've, I've, in my head set the same <laughs> he has to but yeah like I was really really surprised to see that I would think with Pedersen and Milan they're complementary you have Pedersen's more the attack he gets in a group ahead doesn't have to yep. work because I got this really quick sprinter and behind and he can even without sprint. the sprinter he does it yeah so I was really surprised to see that and, and I take your point he might be I'm sure there's a reason. This is more a fan in me speaking. I wanted yeah. to see Pedersen at the race with the shape he's got. You can see, I think he animates the race and there could be bad weather where he gets like 50 watt buff. But I'm sure there's a reason maybe he, he wants to peak for Flanders or Rebe. But then I'm thinking like, if your Trek isn't winning one of the opening weekend races kind of a really, like it's actually attainable goal. Yeah. And they don't win it. A, they didn't win a big classic last year. Am I right? Like, when Peterson won Hint Wevel him against Van der Poel and Wout van Aert, that was a big thing for, for yeah. Trek that year. And Omlo would also be pretty damn big, in my opinion. So I wanted to see Steven plus Peterson plus Milan, with Peterson as the obvious leader, with Milan as the backup sprinter, Steven yeah. as domestique slash rider that goes into early moves to try and upset other people a bit that's kind of the vibe i get then again Steven would ride in any group even if it would be negative towards Peterson. but uh, that being said that would be a team that i would put not at the level of visma but on a level where they could be seen as okay you need to help control the race a bit if you're visma you're thinking that but with the team they're sending now i think visma can't show up at their at their team car and say you guys need to put Tim de Klerk for the brake control at the start. Then again, that's what he's made to do. That's why he, what he was born to do. But you know what I mean, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, maybe they try to put de Klerk in the brake. I, I don't know. I don't know. Why not? Well, like, well, yeah, why not? Uh, you got to use him <laughs> some way. Uh, probably the uh, the favorite. So the favorite for the race is Van Aden and probably three other Visma riders. But then the. the Probably the nearest favourite not on that team is Arno De Lee on Lotto Destiny. They look good in, in January in the Mallorcan races. Uh, then they went to Tenerife and Tere. I would say De Lee looked... Uh, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to say, but in, in, in Classic Ahen, I thought he looked a little bit... Yeah, he got dropped earlier than I expected. Uh, 
and and in Mercia. And in Almeria, his sprint wasn't what I expected it to be. In addition to that, so no. I'm not going to to the Omlop with full confidence that the Lee will be at the same level of last year. I need to see something before I can say something like that. Like his team surrounding him, Campenarts, the Buys, Berlins, Grignar, and and Van Moor. I'm pretty sure if I go through this. Yeah. I'm on the r- right roster, right? That's a professional yeah, yeah, start yeah. list. So, Berlin's look good. I think he's yeah. a good rider. I th- he was he was 28 for something in Roubaix last year. So I think he's really good as like a he a in type last week. classics rider. Uh, Van Moor was at a good level in Bessage, if I recall correctly. Campenards, I'm not sure about. As in, I would expect Campenards to be at a decent level, but I can't vividly recall him being amazing in the races we've seen so far yet then again it's going to be very limited he only did Andalusia TT so far Uh, (laughs) well no but no no but I actually thought I I know I thought he'd do better there uh, as well so (laughs) I think yeah delete it it could be that he came down from altitude not feeling good and he'll be fine in a week yeah I don't know Uh, but he'll be when you look at him in Omlope last year crashed in a corner Came back uh, in time for uh, Molenberg. Missed also, the split. Oh, was, was right there. And then dropped everybody on the moor, except Morich and the Wellens. Pulled. Then beat Laporte in the sprint. That's, that's the guy. So I'm hoping we see that. I'm hoping we see that as well. But it's also like... He hasn't won this year in the lead up either, which last year he was he was cleaning up True, the sage except on yeah, Mont Bouquet. Yeah. Um then in Morocco he won something as well. So yeah. he had been winning. So for the confidence, I think that would also have helped if he already won on Miria or something. So anyway, let's hope we've got a competitor in that rider. But how do you think the race I don't will know. play out? How do I think the race will play out? There's so many scenarios, because last year, I've, if I recall correctly, there was a split on the Kattenberg already, which was very early in the race, yes. like one of the earlier hills, where Visma had a group of like Pre, was it, five yeah. to six riders before coverage, with the Lee in the group, with some other riders in the group. But the the thing that always seems to happen in those scenarios is that you could, you then suddenly get like a different split, you know, like because nobody's going to be working with six Jumbo riders or Visma riders. So... Then they try and get another rider ahead and so forth. But eventually that that got crawled back. And I think Molenberg is always the climb that I think of when I think of Omelop and Newsblood, you know? That's logical, right? That's yeah. like the, no, the narrow return, climb, narrow run in. steep, narrow running, fight for positioning. That's super important. That's where a Visma could literally put a Fina at the front with six riders behind him <laughs> and then they hope that they've got a split with four Visma riders or something up the road but that also feels like a telephone in thing as in that's what a lot of teams will expect Visma to do so will they try to do it earlier on um, I'm not sure which climb really fits we're thinking Valkenberg Wolvenberg is that a scenario where you can see that happen because how I see it is that Visma is the only team on the start list that I expect to pull on, that to full on initiate at a certain point in this race, and the other teams will have to like rack up and be ready when that happens. And, and unlike the Tour of Flanders, you look at the parkour and you're like, well, can they anticipate that whenever that bomb is going to get dropped? It's like, well, okay, well, let's say a Wellens and a Morich and Asgren go in like literally the first Holoveg or something. And let's assume it's good weather. There's a 50% chance of rain. If it's if it's bad weather, cold, five degrees, wind, all bets are off. Yeah. Shit can hit the fan from literally the hard hook with 40Ks done. Like it really depends on the weather. Assuming good weather, like if they go on the Pavastrat with 80Ks to go, there's like half an hour of asphalt, yeah, sort of big roads where they're going to get chased down. It's not like Tour of Flanders when uh, Pedersen went on the Tyenberg and then it was hard. So, yeah, it's going to be... I don't see Philipson... I don't see how Philipson can win, can win this race unless he is taking a big, big step up. I think it's been very, very difficult for someone like that. What about Binny? I don't know, man. I think he might be too isolated does that make sense? Yeah. 
One surf as first in, classic, good in good in those TDU sprints. The thing I see with the Lee, with Binyam, with all those riders, and I'm not sure Milan has the has it to get over all these hills if if shit hits a fan either in a similar way as Phillips and like he's versatile. Phillips is versatile as well, but when shit truly hits the fan, they'll need to be there too, you know? And then I look yeah. at Binyam and the Lee, and those are riders that can get over a hill or two that can get over these hills and maybe make these splits and so forth. And then I'm thinking, uh, then you're stuck in a group with with 75 Visma riders. So good luck solving that scenario. <laughs> so then, <laughs> there's so much that can, that can occur here, but it's also, I agree with this, with what you're saying when it comes to the parkour. It's not RVV. It's not likely that you can open up the race with 100 kilometers to go in an easy way. And it just lasts... Because last year it happened like that, eh? It opened up early, but it didn't necessarily last. And no, it, it opened and then Rambal anticipated straight after the regroupment after Molenberg and that was it. Yep. There, there really wasn't too much else and then Milan went with him. Uh, the big name I guess we haven't mentioned is Pidcock, who uh, I'm glad he's here and is someone yep. he looked pretty good in Algarve. Uh, like he came third on the stage to Malal today, so... Uh, he also brings with him, uh, sorry, he, he brings them Turner and Hajduk, but he doesn't have Sheffield, at least on the provisional start list. They've only got six listed. Uh, so it's not Ineos best classics team. Maybe Chef is going. Uh, so he might be, I think he'd be isolated early. Uh, yeah. Peacock. I uh, surely Kwiatkowski will do it as well. If Turner shows up, then he's uh, normally, if he's in decent shape, also relatively good surrounding Pitcock, I would reckon. Yeah, he's but good, yeah. those are also the limited names. So I feel like Ineos is not here with their best team. That's that's how I perceive that list. And there, there's other teams where I'm also thinking, okay, there's a few riders missing that I expected to perhaps be here. Uh, like the obvious one is that Van der Poel is not here, of course. That we don't have the Pogacars of the world that we're looking at. At Van Aert and, and the Visma team as the obvious favorites. And quick step, we're looking at Alaphilippe and Osgrain and like, yeah, what do you the expect two from where them? Wasn't expecting them? Or what do you expect from them? Oh, I, I kind Contract of feel like here. I'm expecting them to try and follow whatever shit hits the fan and then try and benefit from a situation like that. Because I don't see this team as necessarily the, the initiation one. I'm curious to see what Moscon is like back at Quick Step. That's True, the one where I'm yeah. really curious. Because that could that could do something. I maybe expected a a Lamperti or Manier to show up in Kurne or one of them in Omlop. But to see I think Lamperti might be in Kurne, I'm not sure about it. But I might have expected one of them to show up on the on the Quick Step side list for Omlop, no? Uh, yeah, I'm surprised that neither neither of those two are here, and uh, that Hill Helders is not here, uh, and he's not doing UAE tour either. So he's back from the Middle East. So uh, I am surprised. Maybe they didn't want to have the young guys do Oman and then do opening weekend because all three of them did that. Uh, but Hill Helders impressed me in uh, in TDU. He won Ken Wevelhem Juniors or U23. Like, frankly. I would have him instead of Casper Pedersen. Uh, they do have Wara. How do you say, Benji? Van Gerluwer. But relatively perfect, actually. I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm flying. Uh, he's a classic. Axel Zangler, top boy. 10. Young talent, French Ryan Uh I've got to say, he's consistent in Provence. Uh, but I hoped he would beat Pedersen. I was looking for that extra step up when Pedersen did all the work. Uh, mm -hmm. Bahrain, you can't count out. They'll be active as yep. well as... I'm surprised Cosin for us not here for Decathlon. There's a lot of those sort of riders who I'm surprised are not here. Uh, like, they're in good shape. I know he's probably going to do the French Classics or, like, Michael Matthews. They're not going to win Tour of Flanders. And uh, they're not doing this race where I think they can get a really good result. Uh, yep. Especially someone like Matthews. is surprising to me. But Are we... Uh are we disrespecting Wellens by mentioning him in a limited fashion? Because I feel like he's in the same scenario that I see. Uh, it's it's you you said 
comparing Lascano to Mohoric might not be perfect, but I feel like when it comes to their role in the race, the way they should probably play it, they're all going to be thinking similarly. Like, Wellens, Lascano, like uh, Mohoric, they'll all try to try to anticipate because they can't sprint. <laughs> That's the problem like, for Wellens. He really can't sprint uh, at all. So, well, he, he was what? Top three strongest in opening weekend last year, yeah. fair to say? Because he got caught at the finish line yeah. in Omlope, and he yeah. was he him and Morris dropped to Lee on on the moor, and then yeah. Kerner he was very strong, but Vizma's tactics played him and Morris. But he's just if you're isolated and there's four Vizmas and you got Jorgensen now in the team, Tratnik who is unbelievable shape, like it's so difficult to to do anything or to do your own race. You just have to. You're always reacting. Um, Maybe, maybe the other teams should align and against Visma. Maybe we'll, I think we'll see that, and we'll see that from probably kilometer zero, where they're like, "No, you chose the breakaway. You brought six leaders and one ruler. Yeah, spend the ruler for three hours." Uh, but that's Omlope. Uh, and like, I, who you got winning? Well, who I got winning? Ooh, that's a difficult one. Oh my god, Trotnik's been looking so good the last yeah, two weeks. Yeah, I was gonna pick Trotnik. I want to go with Trotnik too, but. Well, I said his name first, so I can. Yeah, you can go. But I think it's boring to pick a Visma rider when they show up with six leaders. So we've, we've been talking about, about a lot about decathlon riders, but we didn't mention them. Like, do we expect the resurgence of, of decathlon in the classics? Do we expect the Bond no. Mass and the Pestle and so forth to show up? The Pestle no. was, I don't know, he, he had an okay time trial at Andalusia, I guess. But, <laughs> oh, I think Kung is going to do well. I think Kung okay. will Kung top is 10. good now, yeah. But winning? I'm not sure he has it to win on low. <laughs> so, um, fuck, man. Ugh. I'll go with Tratnik. Okay, I will go with... Yeah, Tratnik was who I would also pick. Uh, well, but I'm going to go with that. I'm going to go with the favourite, Wout van Aert. Uh, I don't think he's giving. Yeah, I think he's gonna want to make a statement. And Algarve was the prep race. Uh, Kerner's the next day. Kerner is like a, a different sort of race in that it's, it's flat uh, in the last eighty or seventy kilometers. But there's a, a much longer hill zone with longer hills. The uh, Kreuzberg, Côte de Trieu, one point two k seven percent. The Kreuzberg, uh, the Mont Saint Laurent. So it's really can the the hares or the the climby boys get enough of a gap so they can hold on for 60 k's before the after that hill zone uh for the sprinters team so i really like kerner it's really delivered excitement yeah. the last few years uh i seem to remember the oh the asgrim was very very good but that start list is usually very very similar a few more sprinters come in like damar for archaea and riders like Bini, I think, become much more realistic in winning because there's no... If, if Visma don't get it right in the hill zone and they don't get enough of a gap or predictably no teams work with them after that and Intermarche and other teams can band together on a flat parkour to chase, then it's much more realistic that Bini can win a sprint or uh, Philipson can win the sprint. He's here for Alperson to Koenig. So I see Kerner as much more, uh, not much more, but quite more, a bit more open than Omlo. I, um, it's, it's kind of the one year where I feel like I don't have confidence in a sprint in Kerner. Really? Yeah. And the reason that I think that's the case is because when I look at the provisional start list, there's only one sprinter there. So <laughs> that helps That helps my case. Actually, DeMar is here as well. I, I hadn't noticed DeMar yet, but I'm looking at Philipson, if I recall, DeMar, if I recall. And then we're looking at a Piffy, a Govacar. Well, Binny, like, if you're Binny, you don't want to sprint against Philipson on the line either. Right? You won the harder race anyway, so... Would you rather sprint against Philipson than Kerner? <laughs> or be in a group of four Vismas. I agree, I don't know. but 
I think beating Phillips in the sprint is also an unlikely scenario. Yeah. The Lee's not on the provisional <laughs> start lists. <laughs> yeah. I would have I'm preferred to see the Lee start here. list. Because if you're the Lee, you want to get... Your goal, if you're the Lee, is winning a classic, right? Yeah. So And Kuhner is a prestigious race. Yeah. So I, I would have liked seeing him in Kuhner instead of like Le Samad the next week, for example, stuff like that. Um, but he ain't here, so we got to live with it. Kristoff's of the world. Oh, should we still count it as like top sprinter? I don't know. Nah, Kristoff can't sprint anymore. Kvarnskjold's <laughs> better. So... I'm not looking at the biggest sprint field, and as a consequence, I feel like we're just going to have an open race, have a hard race, wind will play a role most likely, and I think this is the one where Visma could clean if they really get it right. I'm going to go with Marius Meyerhoff for winning this race, uh, just because... <laughs> Tudor look all right. He looked okay in a sprint in uh, Algarve, yep. decent in Mallorca, decent on a, a hilly course uh, in Figuera. So I'm going to go with him. And another one who's doing Kerner is Vito Breit, 23-year-old on Antomarche. Just watch out for him. He might sneak a top 10 uh, if it's a really, really hard race. He seems to climb decently well. So, uh, yep. But yeah, otherwise I'll go for Laporte, probably I'd say Laporte winning this. I've got a a one two for Visma with Vanard gifting it to Van Barle. <laughs> Why would he gift what? it to Van Barle? It makes yeah. no sense. Van Barle's <laughs> under, he doesn't need gifts. <laughs> Benoit is like a previous winner, but Benoit's just been I think he had COVID at the start of the year, then crashed last week in Algarve, if I recall correctly. Yeah, so he did. I'm not sure if we can expect the Benoit that we had last year. He was also sick last year, but that was earlier before this prep. Uh, so I don't know. I'm I'm not sure what to expect from Benoit, but I don't expect him to be on the level of Trotnik. Is the preview of these two races, does that mean we both think, Benji, that the what happened last year is set to be repeated this year, which is that essentially Visma will dominate most of the classics up to the Tour of Flanders and Roubaix and then the big boss comes in Van der Poel and everything changes once he's in the race. I think that's a scenario I'm looking at because Visma has the team that they should be cleaning up these smaller classics to be honest and then when it comes to these big races the ones where we're looking at Ronde van Vlaanderen where we look at at, uh, at Paris-Roubaix those are ones where it is more difficult to apply your numerical advantage than it is on these smaller classics because it's harder to get through 250 kilometers of a, a Tour of Flanders. There's more altitude meters. Half of your team will end up dropping by the time the final really happens. You will have to respond to more anticipation because there's more space to anticipate in the big races. So in RVV, the group with, was it Osgrain last year to get away with, um, was it Merlier that was in the group helping him, for example, with Jorgensen and so forth? Those kind of groups happen in RVV. In, in Roubaix, you'll have anticipation as well. Roubaix is an added luck percentage on top of that. I, I do feel like this is the best year for Wout van Aert compared to last year to win RVV. Because while van der Poel is there, and I consider van der Poel to have an advantage on van Aert, I would say that Pogacar not being an RVV is a major bonus for Van Aert. Because if Pogacar's there, Van Aert can't win. Yeah, when Pog- Pogacar can do the last 50 kilometers three minutes faster than Van Aert. Yeah. So what tactics, I'm all ears, what, <laughs> there's not many tactics to, d- to defend against that. Uh, like Pogacar's just special in the final Tour of Flanders. So uh, Roubaix's different. Roubaix, Van Aert is probably is his best race or the race he's most naturally suited towards. But yeah, whereas Van der Poel still is the best overall classics rider in the world, but the uh, sort of on the on Quamont, I'm less expecting him and he ha- to just like ride away from Van Aert with 55 kilometers to go uh, yeah. in Flanders. But yeah, that's that's the sort of I expect a similar pattern to last year, and so hopefully we have exciting races on opening weekend. Hopefully it's well not if it's bad weather and, and crosswinds. Unfortunately, we probably 
won't see that before coverage starts. Coverage normally starts around the Parastrat Hachok, first Hachok, yeah. with about 100 or 90 Ks to go. Uh, but yeah, that was our opening weekend preview. We'll obviously have daily coverage of those uh, races. Twitter Rwanda also kicked off ye today. Uh, Quickstep Dev Team won the TTT. The GC favorites, William Le Cerf, uh, who looked very, very good in Saudi when he attacked on Skyview's climb. So he's but- against... Latour, I guess. Latour, Chris Froome. Uh, we 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 gotta keep in mind Chris Froome. There was another name that I I thought of when I was looking through the start list outside Glivar, of Glivar, the Slovenian. Uh, yeah, Gal Glivar on the on the UAE kiddo team, on the Gen Z team, I think was the name of it. But that being said, I reckon Lacer Latour Glivar might end up being the the top three of this race. But they had a TTT today, not counting for GC, but allowing teams to use. TT bikes if they have it. So some teams that don't have that to their availability, road road bikes, some TT bikes. I don't know. It's weird for me to have a TT that doesn't count for GC. My head does not make sense. But I guess it's a compromise for the fact that not every team can prov- can have TT bikes. But then just do the, the TTT yeah, my with guess would, normal bikes. Well, my guess would be don't do a TTT at all. Yeah, exactly. If, That's a uh, good what's point. The point? Uh, what is the point? Uh, Showing I guess all the teams, p- I guess? To practice, like it's an advantage for the, the dev teams to otherwise, when are these young guys going to practice doing a TTT? The first TTT they're going to do is in a World Tour stage race. Yeah. At UA True. Tour. So maybe, or Paranese. So maybe that's the attraction for it. I think they should do the same in Lavenir. I don't think in Lavenir it should count for GC. Even if they do want to do it for development, it shouldn't count towards yeah. uh, GC. Uh Otherwise, Gran Camino is probably the the other stage race that's worth watching this week. Very, very strong start list. Weakened a little bit because Quintana's out with uh, COVID infection well, that he apparently picked up. Yeah, he wasn't Ain't moving the anyway. needle, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but this is where, I mean, Ineos team is much stronger uh, than its UAE tour team. Hater Rodriguez, Castro, Freyla, Bernal, Tarlin, Kwiatkowski, they ain't messing about. That's one of their, that's like a Vuelta team, frankly. Carapaz here for EF, alongside Piccolo, Paulus, Uran, uh, and Carthy. That's their Vuelta or Tour team. Sosa here, uh, but Quintana was supposed to be here. And uh, Lenny Martinez and Godou, that's their Tour team, Grupama FDJ. And obviously then uh, Vingegaard returns, the Tour de France champion, with uh, Tullet and Alter Brooks, Kelderman, uh, not sure who else. So this race, Benji, restarted uh, two years ago in 2022 and now has a ridiculous start list. I agree, but despite the ridiculous start lists, Vingegaard should clean this. I know it's start of the season, but Vingegaard should clean this. Well, I mean, his his GC rivals that I've just read out, unfortunately, there's a, a hilly ITT, 15Ks, he should be beating uh, Rodriguez in that sort of TT if he carry if he's in any sort of shape. Uh, but I guess there's some tricky medium mountain stages like stage one, uh, stage two from Tabuada to Shantada is they do repetitions of a five k six percent climb. EF I dare say might try something there. Yeah, but uh, there's another hill stage. Got to always try too early. Yeah. And then the final stage is 7Ks, 8%. So it's going to be a good race. I mean, if you see these guys attacking each other, it's it's always exciting. And a 2.1, I can't wait to watch. Do you think... Is Hater the favorite for the TT? Or no, Tarling. Tarling. Even with the, the hill and the slight Even cobble the section hill? at the end. Okay. It's not a crazy hill, right? Let me check it to be sure. They're not spreading nonsense. Ah, it's 1. Not 1.5 kilometers, 4.8%. Tarling should win this time trial. Okay. Uh, and then Hayda, it's going to be tough for him if they kick off on this on stage two. It is a flat finish, but after 5k, 6% climb. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to this race. And Mate, uh, the- Berwick. Yep. He starts here for Caja Rural. He did Andalusia. And Murthia, but yeah, let him go in the breakaway. Come on, let him have a break, Queen. I uh, I also want to mention 
Jefferson Alvaro Cepeda. Yeah. He who did a shockingly good Vuelta Andalusia TT. Fourth. He's look, he looked good last year in Andalusia too. Uh, there's also Davide Piganzoli, who just won the Tour of Antalya, which Benji attended. He also beat uh, Isaac Del Toro in the mountaintop finish TT in Lavenir last year, the Italian climbing yep. prospect. He was second to Ricciatello, the other Italian-American climbing prospect. So how will he go on these shorter climbs uh, against more serious competition? That'll be an interesting acid test uh, for him on Palti Cometa. There's also the French Opening Hill Classics. They're good races, but I'll be honest with you, I watch them during the week after opening weekend uh, <laughs> because, yeah, uh, I want to focus on the Belgian Classics. That's all the race previews and recaps, Benji. We've got... I want to talk about the Alps and De kit first. I think the UCI has to step in and do something. And obviously, the opportunity for that has passed because I presume kits go to the UCI for approval the amount of navy with white accent kits in the peloton at the moment is unbelievable if we look through the teams quick step now alperson and they already had it movistar little trek groupama fdj it's five kits israel israel sorry yeah a pro team israel is very very similar but like Alperson's is identical to Quick Steps now. They've changed the kit to, yeah, it's a double denim, but it goes blue, then a white band in the middle with a red with Alperson, but that's where yeah. the Sudal is on the Quick Steps. So the same red patch is there, and then blue again on the bottom of the jersey. It looks so similar to Quick Steps. It's shockingly similar, even from up close. Obviously, you see the difference from up close, but like, if you're like squinting a little bit, you wouldn't see which jersey it is. So that's that's how much it it looks. And on the helicopter, you definitely won't see the difference. So I fully agree. This shouldn't be this shouldn't be happening. Like a kid shouldn't be allowed to have the exact same shape and colors as as Quick Step. Yes, it's denim. Yes, it's kind of jeans like. But sorry, but. The, the differences are way too limited for... Th this is, first of all, bad for newer viewers or mainstream viewers to really... Uh, who's who's this guy riding for again? Oh, we've got Quick Step. No, it's Alperson. Wait, are those the same team? Stuff like that. But it's also for brand recognition. Th this can't be great for, for Alperson, the Koenig, for Solo and Quick Step neither, eh? Like, everybody must be hurting. That's what I mean. It, it, surely, okay, you want to have... Your goal is to... The sponsors have requirements of how their colors look, etc. I understand that. But if if no one knows where your team is or where your riders are or it doesn't stand out, isn't that a problem? Like EF, yep. you know where every EF rider is at all times. Visma's actually yellow. There's no other solitary yellow kit there's intermarche yep. though sometimes you can see and visible gonna have to change in the tour at least i'm surprised these teams don't want to be to stand out more because it, it all blends into one in Arcaea, very very similar like on the road it looks really really close the ineos shade now is uh, much closer to archaeas this year i just don't i don't get it I, yeah, I don't get why they... <laughs> why? Like, like, no way... Like, surely they know what they're doing, Benji, when they make that kit Alberson to Koenig. Yeah, like, like they, maybe, they must see maybe, that maybe it's Quick it's on Steps purpose. kit. Maybe it's on purpose. Maybe they thought, we've stolen their team format, which is having <laughs> yeah. multiple sprinters and a classics team. That's the good old Quick Step format, as in, like, five, six years ago. Alberson... The Koenig is now doing that better. We've we've shown ourselves to be that team. Now they want to now they want to steal the actual cloning as well, and they want to actually immerse themselves in being that. But anyway, like jokes aside, their bike looks absolute fire. Their yeah, kid I don't cool. like, and the fact that it looks like Quick Step carbon copy paste of it, that's garbage. So sorry, but that's F tier. Are we rating it? Yeah, I also don't know why it's uh, released now, but maybe and they just didn't. Why is it denim? Such a gimmick. Know, 
You guys in Benelux love your denim jean shorts. Fuck no. Yeah, you do. Come on. I don't. <laughs> I don't even own denim. Um, I see denim a lot in Benelux. <laughs> the amount you of guys, times you're you, in Benelux. You, you went you guys, once. You guys love the distressed <laughs> denim. Man came to Netherlands once. I see it on TV 25 million hours a year. So all I watch is crowds of people in the Benelux region. You have a million races. I've seen enough of Benelux. And I'll be there in a month. Um, okay. Otherwise, um, you could listen to the full interview or, or if you speak French or, or read the full interview if you want on Cyclism Actu. They had a sit-down uh, full interview with Nicola... Oh, with not Nicola Prudom. <laughs> the Decathlon writer. With, <laughs> with Christian Prudom, uh, the effectively day-to-day boss of... Uh, ASO. ASO. I know the videos automatically played, which I can't turn off, which is a very annoying part of the website. But basically, the the gist of this interview, or what I got from it, was he just didn't seem phased by the one cycling project at all. It yeah. seemed to him to be like, it's another Hammer series, it's another breakaway league attempt, it won't work, they don't have their ducks in a row, we'll outlive this. Yeah, and... I feel like the other things I I heard of, like I saw something about a, an interview with Milan Erdzin, for example, the Bahrain boss, and he was discussing the fact that uh, that they might now be talking about all these big races like RVVN World Championships. We want some kind of three-day format, and one of them could be a time trial and stuff like that. And I'm like, dude, you're you're discussing the Hammer series again. It didn't work last time. It ain't gonna work again. Like, no matter if you name if it's a Flanders Classics race or not. And even, why would Flanders Classics want that in the first place, change the format of their races? Like, the more I hear from it, from the more people involved, the more it seems like how the people don't even know what it's about. And I think ASO normally don't. That's why it's an interesting interview, having the uh, the big boss, uh, the most senior person outside of the Amory family, uh, Christian Prudhomme, I'm speaking yeah. about, about this. Normally, ASO don't really comment on ongoing things like this too much. They're pretty tight-lipped. They keep to themselves. Uh, and I think the fact that he's even speaking about it, to me, is almost like hes he just doesn't see it as a threat. Like, if he was like, this is a big yep. thing, we might have to negotiate in the next couple of months or year with this, I feel like he would have said, I'm not commenting on it, about it. But yep. to me, it seems like ASO is unfazed. Certainly, they're not involved and so it's proceeding without them if it is proceeding. Uh, but whatever idea there was maybe two months ago of like everyone around the table, ASO, RCS, Finals Classics, all the teams, that certainly does not appear to be the case anymore. And I feel like the initial conversation was, okay, we're on the calendar where races don't overlap, but the top riders can be at every single race. And now the conversation seems to have changed towards okay, now we're going to have like an extra racing league under the one cycling banner, and that's going to be outside of Grand Tours, that riders can still use that to prepare for Grand Tours, and the one cycling top riders will then use that and be there, and that's a completely different storyline already. Yeah. Like, major difference. So I'm curious what format it will land on, because that will 100% decide whether it's successful or not. Because the initial storyline, it being like a one cycling a thing that basically is the new calendar that's a thing but if you then have like the other old calendar next to it with other races that aren't part of it and then riders jump from the one cycling events to the others then you've got hammer series again i know yeah and so stay tuned but uh whether this sort of drops in in three four months as some as a big game changer i'm not uh i'm not so sure it doesn't sound like that at the moment uh, based on people that are speaking publicly about it but yeah go and read the transcript of that interview if you're interested in hearing more uh, otherwise there's a curious interview with Vlasov I think in the Italian <laughs> press Benji and this is we've seen this with UAE first with Almeida Almeida said it's not my job to decide how I race in the tour. I'll race for myself. It's for the directors to figure it out. Paraphrasing here. Uh, when people said, well, it's all in for Poggy. Because they go, are you so Almeida? Yates? Poggy. Then you had Vlasov this week. He said, 
I'm not going in as a domestique. We go in as as co-leaders, and then we see who's the strongest with Roglic at Bora for the tour. And then Koos gave an initial interview where people asked him his ambitions, and he said, uh, yeah, he'd like to go in and, and lead the tour team as well. And I think he, in a subsequent interview, he backtracked a little bit and said, I didn't want to appear under-ambitious. I, I know that, you know, Vingegaard is, is the boss at the end of the day in the tour, but still, three different teams, Benji, potentially with leadership quarrels. Yes, but I think... Visma the one I'm, is the one I'm least worried about. As in, Vingegaard is going to be all-out leader there, but I think they're always going to use Kuz as co-leader initially, if it's possible. It's worked before, they might as well try it again, until it doesn't. And if it doesn't work, they still have him as domestique anyway. So it's not like that will remove him from his domestique duties. He will be super domestique, co-leader, and if he sees an opportunity, they'll use him in GC in some shape or form. That's how I perceive that. And the man just won the Vuelta as well. He was better than all the other competition in that in that race outside of Visma. So he has the right to talk as well. He, he has the right to say, oh, I want to be co-leader in some shape or form. I don't think he sees himself as, oh, I'm, I'm on the same level as Vingega. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that phase. And that's also not the way he said it in my head. Then... UAE, when it comes to Almeida and so forth, Pogacar, Ayuso, and Yates, I've got no clue what's going to happen with UAE at the Tour de France. That's the beauty of it. The beauty of it is that we don't know. Because Pogacar's done the Giro, what shape will he come into the Tour de France for? We don't know that. Ayuso, Almeida, and Yates. We know Yates has brought him to Tour de France. He could be some kind of co-leader fashion. Is he better than Vingegaard? No, but it's going to be really cool to see all four of these leaders try and upset Vingegaard in some shape or form. So I think that could be a good vibe going on in that race. I reckon Al- Almeida and Yates have got not necessarily the confidence in to really put pressure in that shape or form, but when it comes to Ayuso, he's kind of unpredictable in my head, whereas he, if he can get to a higher level than he was last year, then I want to see him try some some crazy stuff. I feel like he's he's got that cyclism in him. When it comes to Bora, Roglic, main leader, the team has already said it, kind of. Hindley, I think he has a right to talk. I think he has right to talk and say, I want to be a co-leader at the start. Flazov, zero right to talk. When it comes to the Tour de France co-leadership, he's not shown anything to be able to say, I want to start off the Tour de France as co-leader, stuff like that. Hindley, full warranted. He can say that stuff. He was in the yellow jersey initially, then crashed and dropped out of top five, if I recall correctly. But Flazov, nah. For Paris-Nice, he said in the same article something about Paris-Nice co-leadership. Sure. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. But a Tour de France? Fuck no, dude. Show it first. The problem is both Hindley and Vlasov are out of contract. And so we saw this situation with Adam Yates in the Tour de France in 2022 at Ineos where basically he didn't have a contract extension offer from them. And so he was like, I can't sacrifice my GC position yeah. for Thomas and then worsen my contract offers and i think even g said on uh what's the steep 2.7k 10 percent climb where poggy did like seven watts per kilo for 12 minutes and vingo was in his will anyway that steep climb yeah, yeah it's helped g a little bit and g was like thanks i was thankful to adam because i know he's in a difficult spot with the contract hinley and vlasov are both out of contract they have to first hinley they should probably extend he won the giro and don't bring Vlasov. Vlasov, why is he not doing the Giro? He's got TTKs and a really shallow start list. Yep. Makes no sense to me. We agree. Martinez doing the <laughs> Giro. And it's like Martinez and Vlasov co-leadership, that makes sense at the Giro. Because Martinez, but, he's you don't know what you're going to get with him in a Grand Tour. So but Vlasov, I do want Martinez at the Tour de France instead of Vlasov then. I think he is at the Tour, No. Oh, okay. Well, if, if he does both, then that's fine. But I would have expected Martinez to be like a domestique in, in the Tour de France for Roglic and, and, and Hindley as, as, as co-leader to try and use Hindley as co-leader. But in, in let's be honest, in the team, they should know Roglic is the guy that is most likely to win the race. Hindley can be that co-leader in the same way that Kuss can be for, for Visma to try and upset things, put pressure on the other teams. 
in like that he win. did on stage five last year. He got in the big breakaway, took the yellow jersey, won the stage. So he's proven exactly. he can do that. But yeah, their their tour team: Hinley, Vlasov, Kamner, Roglic, Sobrero, Martinez. I would I would take Yongles instead of Vlasov. Same. Uh, based on what I saw today, and and send Vlasov as co-leader to the Giro, which suits him better anyway. And then yep. you don't have those problems. And then if he podiums or wins the Giro, okay, extend him. If he doesn't, because he didn't have a good year, Vlasov, last year. He was better in 22. Uh, but, yeah, certainly uh, that was surprising to hear that. Well, no, actually, it wasn't. It wasn't surprising because I also understand it from Vlasov's perspective. Like, what are you going to prepare at altitude? Or, and then I know you should say, oh, we'll be a good teammate. You're still under contract, but... Yeah. I get it, but as a team, you just don't send him to the Tour de France then. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Whereas Hinley, I would expect before the Tour, a grud of that quality, he's either extended there or would sign somewhere else uh, before July. That's 90, what happens in 99% of the cases. Uh, the, the last bit of news was uh, an article on Nasser Buani. Uh, he did, gave yeah. an interview in Le Keep. And basically said, it's a bit sad, to be honest, the interview. And listen, a lot of people don't like Buani in the peloton or outside. He, uh, punching riders or uh, dangerous moves <laughs> in sprints. But just because a rider's done those sort of things or lashed out in, in a race, that doesn't mean that you know a, a really dangerous parkour that ends their career should just go by the by and that's what happened essentially in the tour of turkey uh in 2022 he had a really heavy crash um and like really badly injured his neck and back i think and basically ended his career and he was psychologically damaged from that crash as well he had a number of crashes in short succession he had merlier i think in um one of your chat gpt belgian races Maybe Merlier did a move yeah. and came back and just chopped the shit out of him and Correct. crashed him, I think. And More today? 2022? Uh, I think that's right. And um, How the fuck so, do I know that? <laughs> well, because I think we spoke about it at the time and we said, what if Nasser Buani had done this to somebody else? Yeah. Uh, he probably would have been... Yeah. Uh, Attacked on Twitter attacked on Twitter or it was Egmont or something. Uh, but yeah, yeah he basically, might have. he's well, the interesting thing though, the really interesting nugget from this is he says he's commenced legal proceedings against the organizers of the tour of Turkey. And I don't remember this happening too much except for it was mooted with the Jakobsen crash in the tour de Polonia. Yeah. And I don't think it actually, Lefebvre got, he was like, we're going to do this, do that. I'll take him to court. Um, send this guy of of uh, Yumbo to prison. What do you say about? What was his tweet? A favorite tweet? Send this guy of yeah, send this guy to prison or something. Yeah, or, so, something I don't think like that. It never really happened. And also, uh, to get into the legal weeds a little bit, basically, from what I can see, Buani is had uh, workers' disability insurance or he had like uh, permanent disability insurance or some sort of insurance that uh, if you get injured, and I know a lot of riders, a fair few riders have this, all riders in my opinion should have this. I know it's, it's expensive, uh, but maybe he had it through the team because he was a French team and they got they pay a huge amount to French teams for these sort of things. Should teams provide this or is that? I think they should provide the option or like recommendation that you should get this. I mean, agents should be doing this. It really... Really, it should be the agent that should be sorting it out and making sure the rider has it, or at least saying, "Listen, you know, yeah, it's going to cost you forty grand a year. It's a lot of money. If you're on, you know, I'm not talking about neo pros here. I'm talking about guys like Buani who are probably on, yeah, over five hundred k. But uh, yeah, it sounds like he's claiming under that insurance, and then the insurance probably want to uh, go after the the race organizer because it says. He says, I could have raced for at least another three years. So he's probably claiming under his insurance or or, one, or maybe he doesn't have the insurance. Maybe he's claiming for his lost wages for those three years. And to be honest, that was a horrific crash and it wasn't good enough. Uh, 
to safety in that race, uh, frankly. So, oh yeah, I it's also the specific scenario in which a crash happened was that there was a spectator, physically a uh, physically disabled spectator that that walked onto the course or that stumbled onto the course in some shape or form. And I said in sh in some shape or form so many times in this podcast. I'm sorry about that. But that caused the crash with Buhani, and I'm like, how can Buhani prove that that is the organizer's fault? Is it, can an organizer prevent? Like, I fully agree, Tour of Turkey organizers, horrible the last five years when it comes to parkour safety. But how can we expect an organizer to keep every person of the road across 200 kilometers? Yeah, it's impossible, really. So that's the thing. It's, it's If an organizer has failed to comply with safe organization rules, be it yeah. uh, the barriers, uh, bend, uh, road infrastructure, potholes, something like that, and then a rider crashes, I can really see, okay, they've breached a rule here. Yeah, They've breached their obligations for the safety of the riders. Uh, and I can see how he could. There's a legal argument there, but you're right. If someone just the person just wandered onto the road, what can you do? I guess was should it be barried off at that point? Was it supposed to be? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, like, certainly, there's been some issues with that race. Uh, but not just that race, other races. And I guess this is where like the Safe R initiative is supposed to like have another independent body looking at safety in, in the races. But yeah. to be honest, I don't know why the UCI doesn't, uh, you know. But again, the UCI can't stop someone wandering onto the course. That's just, you'd have to completely change cycling. You can't barrier off 200 kilometers. Yep, I agree. Uh, otherwise, he also said, uh, when he's referring to his years with Cofidis, uh, that, it was all or nothing at Cofidis, led by team vo boss Vasseur. I became the victim of psychological harassment there. It manifested itself in public humiliation and constant quarrels. It really made me hate cycling. So, uh, yeah, just a really, really sad interview with Buhani, uh, who, yeah, not everybody's favorite, but also uh, seems like he had a pretty tough time of it, yeah. not just at the crash in Turkey, but from the last eight, ten years uh, as well giving that this guy won um yeah in 2014 like four grand tour stages just about a four or five with the between the giro and the welter and then it just kind of went downhill uh from there when he joined Cofidis in 15 any other news benji Ooh, i i don't think so i think uh i mainly wanted to talk about my training side for the for the March challenge we've got going on, the Flow on the End challenge, and I gotta be quickly because I've got about 9% of my battery left, so I'm getting worried. So, my training this week sucked. Like, it's my fifth best week in the last two years when it comes to training hours, but it's not the amount of hours I wanted. And I felt like every single kilometer that I did during training today, uh, t this week, felt like an obstacle. It was one of those weeks where I think, you look at, is it motivation? Is it fatigue? And I think it's more motivation than fatigue this time around because I, before the rides, I feel like, ooh, I can, I can take on the world. I get on my bike. And I think it's because when I've got these weeks where I want to get a certain video out or two videos out or, or stuff like that, my mind is like, I want to spend my time on that and everything else is exhaustion. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I get the same thing. I kind of need, even though you say, oh, I've only got to train two hours. I've got plenty of other time to do stuff throughout the days. That's why in Australia it was good because I'd ride 4.30 to 6.30 and it's like you're in a fugue state. You don't even realize you're riding at that early in the morning. Uh, whereas here, I waited a bit long. Well, at least you didn't crash, Benji. So, yeah. that's the benefit. Uh, I'll show you off there what, what, my, what my hip situation is. So, um, but I'm not least, sure yeah, I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah, uh, <laughs> LRCP only fans. You get to see, <laughs> get to see road rash. <laughs> People would fan, you know it. <laughs> no, that's that's messed up. <laughs> All right, that seems like a good place to draw a bow on it. Regardless, I'll be doing my joint cycling program. I've put in, I put in today a rest day, and I've 
of uh there's also the readiness school uh that they've just brought out and so that's pretty handy because my readiness to train i can put that at uh, zero for the next uh, maybe a couple of days see how i go midweek i think i'll be all right to get back into some zone two stuff uh then but hope you enjoyed uh the podcast as always we'll be back with uae tour daily recaps i believe benji uh this week if i'm not mistaken so stay tuned for them and then obviously opening weekend recaps uh next weekend thanks for listening ciao